Hello everyone. Uh, this time around I want to talk about uh, some issues that pop up in dialogue, uh, mostly in science fiction and fantasy, but not always. And that and these these particular ones pop up as a result of the usage of the translator convention. Now I was going to combine this with some other dialogue writing fails, but uh, the first iteration weighed in at about 90 minutes, and that was just too long, and it was too unfocused. So I decided to split this up, so that means I've got material for another uh, couple of uh, videos down the road. Um, you may note that I'm using a slightly different format for this video than some of the previous ones, and that's because this one is actually planned a little bit in advance. So I put uh, like four seconds of planning in instead of three, and I actually did some preparation work. I have slides. Uh, and quite frankly, I think uh, overall, uh, this is probably going to work slightly better. But anyway, uh, I, I'm gonna probably end up with better audio as a result anyway. So, the translator convention. Uh, well, what is it really? It, it Basically, it presents to the reader a foreign language in the reader's own language, or at least in the language of the work itself. Now, I'm going to be talking about English language stuff because, well, I speak English, right? So, uh, and it's simpler than just saying in the presentation language and so on. So basically, in English literature, and I'm going to talk about literature, but this applies to uh, television shows, movies, uh, radio plays, anything. Uh, uh, but, so, but I'm going to talk about literature. So uh, basically, uh, you, when you're reading something that's employing the translator convention, you're being presented with a perfect translation of what the characters are saying in their language as if they had said it in English. Now that's an important point. Uh, you are understanding what they're saying as though they're speaking in English. And it's no, you're not actually reading an actual translation of their dialogue. You are understanding what they're saying natively. It just so happens that there's some sort of a magic thing going on, like a babble fish, that is making it sound like English to you. And that is, that's an important point that's often lost, that it's not actually a translation. The writer did not write the dialogue in the original language and then translate it for you. Now, this, uh, this leads to uh, some things that don't quite work uh, when you think it through after the fact. Oftentimes, you'll encounter puns or other humor that only works in English. Uh, and then the, you know, or it would require that the uh, purported language that the uh, characters are speaking behaves exactly like English from the perspective of puns. And that's so highly unlikely that uh, unless the language itself is a descendant of English, and even then it's iffy, because puns and humor can depend on cultural references as well, uh, it's so unlikely that this is that what works in English as a pun or rhyme or anything like that is going to work in any other language. Now, for a science fiction setting uh, or even a fantasy setting, uh, it's not necessarily the end of the world. Uh, you can actually uh, make out that for whatever reason, the common tongue happens to be English. Uh, I'm actually following an amateur story on uh, a website that is using just that, uh, that by some fluke or design, uh, 
uh, the common language across the galaxy happens to be English. And it's it's lampshaded in the uh, in the the actual story. And this gets around the uh, English speaking aliens trope uh, by saying that yes, the aliens are speaking English, but they call it something else. It doesn't deal with the uh, question of just how did multiple species independently develop English, but it's not impossible if you put in the right setting. Okay. Uh, you can work around it. But uh, this doesn't all just show up in science fiction and fantasy. It shows up in uh, other types of literature where you've, that are taking place in a foreign country, say. So uh, say I'm reading a uh, story uh, that was written in English. And here's the key thing here. The original story was written in English. I'm not reading a translation of the story. That adds complications for the translator convention as well. Um, it was written by an English-speaking person, but it's taking place in, I don't know, uh, Germany. Well, it's almost certain that the characters will be speaking German, uh, if they happen to be German, right? So, uh, I can assume, uh, for the purpose of the story that uh, any dialogue I'm reading happens to be in German, that any signs that are mentioned happen to be in German. I, I can assume that, right? Uh, and that's part of the translator convention. And uh, I don't have to be concerned about the vagaries of the German language um, and whether uh, uh, things can be represented properly in English or what have you. Uh, I have a perfect translation of the dialogue uh, that translates the meaning properly into uh, English uh, uh, grammar and vocabulary. Uh, and the same thing goes even if you're translating from English to English. Uh, if you're um, writing something for a modern audience that takes place 800 years ago, when the uh, language may or may not have been intelligible to a modern audience, uh, but certainly the vocabulary will have changed. Uh, you're also getting a perfect translator convention translation. And this works perfectly as long as you don't break it by sending a modern person back to that time and then somehow having them magically be able to talk to everybody. Okay, so that's where you end up with the problem with things like a Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court. Um, so, uh, you know, you need to be careful. Uh, but you still, even though it's a perfect translation with no loss in meaning, you still have to be careful that you don't rely on puns or whatever that only work in English or modern English, as the case may be, for plot points. And that's the key point here I'm trying to make with this bullet point is that if your plot hinges on a pun that only works in English, then you have broken the translator convention. Because now it matters what language the characters are speaking. So your best way around that is to structure your plot so it doesn't depend on puns or misunderstandings of that nature. Now, the translator convention will often make liberal use of foreign words or unusual phrasing uh, or other things as cues to indicate different languages or cultures. And that's perfectly reasonable. Um, if, you, if you're consistent in these cues you use and you don't go over the top with it. One of the common cues that, that's used is to uh, introduce the native language of a character is the ha or the dialogue in question is to start out with a couple of words in that foreign language and then like one statement and then switch to the English and then not bother with any any other uh, foreign uh, uh, words. That does require though that the foreign language exist in some form. Now, it's not so bad with a real human language like German or Spanish or Japanese or something like that. You can definitely 
grab uh, a phrase or two and then go on with with English. Uh, and that that's fine, but if you're dealing with a fictional language that doesn't actually exist, uh, well, you're going to have some issues with that. Uh, and also, uh, using foreign words uh, for names and that sort of thing, uh, or concepts that don't really work in English, uh, that's fine too. Uh, it works better when the language you're borrowing from exists. Uh, if you're making up words on the fly, well, you, you're potentially going to have issues. It's not so bad when you're making up nouns, uh, because, well, nouns often don't follow uh, any particular pattern in any particular language. They tend to be somewhat random. Uh, that's not to say there aren't patterns, but it's not language breaking if a particular noun doesn't fit any particular pattern. And that's perfectly fine. But it's when you start borrowing verbs and things like that, that you need to start thinking about the structure of the language. And, and that's when it gets complicated. So you want to ideally not be making up foreign words and foreign names and so on, and then presenting them in a way that's impossible for the reader to work out what they say. Uh, and that could include anything from random diacriticals being added to things to, um, well, any number of uh, uh, schemes to uh, make some make a name say look foreign, including putting seventy four consonants in a row uh, in a way that's impossible to pronounce. Okay, so uh, that's uh, that's the sort of thing that you, you'll often see. Uh, you'll get names that are unpronounceable, you'll get uh, foreign-looking words that are unpronounceable, or you'll get foreign-looking words that are really just an elaborate cipher for English words. Uh, you know, a letter substitution, uh, uh, add some diacritical marks, and uh, throw in some uh, apostrophes and uh, a couple extra letters here and there, and next thing you know, you've got your foreign word. Uh, it's better to avoid that. You're already using the translator conventions. So if you only have one foreign language, you don't need any of these markers. You can just let, you know, make a note somewhere where an astute reader will notice that it's not English that everybody's speaking. And then you can just go on and nobody needs to be concerned about uh, what language anybody's speaking because they're all speaking the same language. The worst thing you have to deal with is some dialectal variants or accent variants and you can just mention those in the text. If there are multiple languages, then some indicator is definitely warranted. But usually, marking it in the dialogue itself makes things harder to follow, and it's harder for the writer as well. So you're better off just to mention that the characters themselves are speaking some other language. And part of the translator convention is that uh, if two characters are speaking privately, they're speaking in their native language or their preferred language. If they are speaking in a public setting, they're speaking in the preferred public language, which is usually um, in uh, fantasy and science fiction called the common speech. Um, uh, just to save having to name it, right? Whatever the lingua franca is, that's what they'll be speaking in a multi language setting, uh, you know, in a multinational setting. And that's uh, simply just a convenience so that they can understand each other, right? Um, and because the translator convention is at work, you may need to mark a few cases where someone says something to somebody else. And uh, uh, if the reader needs to understand it, but the point of view character doesn't, then you'll have to deal with, uh, with that somehow. Uh, and that's the other thing that the translator convention is, can make good use of is the point of view character. Uh, if the point of view character does not understand what is being said, you can just mention they don't understand what's being said and you don't have to actually write it. Uh, don't bother uh, writing the foreign language words in that case. Just say that the character doesn't understand it uh, or they couldn't make it out. The same thing if they just couldn't hear it, right? Uh, the same type of uh, structure works there. 
so you want to avoid uh, these situations where uh, the where foreign words need to be written out. Now it can work uh, in circumstances, some circumstances, especially when the uh, f the foreign languages are real. Uh, but uh, it does cause problems for translators later who are translating your work into yet another language. So I'll talk about that in the uh, concluding uh, section here, uh, but let's uh, move, move on here. Now, closely related to the second point about puns is cultural conventions and references. Uh, and it's quite common to see that sort of thing in a work that is otherwise employing the translator convention. And you could potentially make some sort of a case that the translator convention is actually translating the culture as well. Uh, but that is very difficult to defend. Uh, Sure, we've got a perfect translation of what people mean to say, and that's perfectly fine. And that is fine if it's idiomatic and current to the, uh, the audience's culture. Uh, that part's fine. But when the characters in the story somehow understand the cultural conventions and references of the audience... That's when it breaks down, and that's when it doesn't make any sense. Just like a pun that only works in English uh, being critical to the development of the plot, just like that doesn't work and uh, should be avoided at all costs. Cultural references and uh, should be avoided at all costs, especially if they are uh, critical to the plot. Uh, Otherwise, you need some means for the characters to have acquired the reference and understand what it means. Uh, so, um, you know, it doesn't make sense to have, and let's use a more concrete example, it doesn't make sense to have somebody from, say, uh, post-Civil War uh, United States uh, taking action based on some uh, some obscure reference in, say, Japanese culture, or non-obscure reference, like, say, the red string of fate. Uh, you wouldn't expect that uh, a farmer in uh, post-Civil War United States is going to be familiar with Japanese culture. They might be, but it's not likely. And the reason I pick that, that, that those two is because uh, at the time, the Japanese culture was very isolationist, so it was really unlikely anybody outside of Japan would be familiar with Japanese culture. So uh, you want to uh, make sure that if you're anything you're writing in as a plot point doesn't rely on cultural conventions that are only valid because of the audience. Now, this also means you have to do your research uh, if you're, you're dealing with a foreign culture that really exists and do your due diligence in creating the culture if it's a culture that you're making up. Uh, if the cultural conventions of the audience do apply, you need to mention that somehow. You need to make it clear to the reader that uh, the uh, characters come from a similar enough culture that the references make sense. Okay, this is actually really critical. So you can't just rely on the translator convention to fix everything up. Okay? Now, I do have to say, uh, in defense of this, that if the story you're telling is some sort of an archetype, uh, you know, or a timeless story, uh, and you're really just translating that story uh, for uh, a modern audience or your current audience, then this might be defensible. It, it might be reasonable to do. Uh, so, for instance, uh, Romeo and Juliet uh, could easily be modified to take place in any time zone, time frame, on any planet, in any culture. Uh, you... And to do that, you would have to change uh, certain uh, 
uh, well, dialogue and events in there. Uh, and you certainly need to translate Shakespearean uh, verse into uh, intelligible language. Uh, you know, so, so there is that. But if you're doing that, you might as well just have everything take place in English and not bother with the translator convention. Still, uh, it could be uh, appropriate. Uh, and and that, uh, that's something that you do have to consider on, on each instance on its own merits. Uh, just because this sort of thing often breaks believability, it doesn't mean you can't do it in your specific circumstances, but make sure you understand the implications of doing it. Now, the translator convention is definitely a beneficial thing, often even when it's screwed up in the ways I've talked about before. Uh, for instance, uh, it avoids any need for the author to know the original language. And that's really helpful in the case where the language is fictional. Uh, if the language itself doesn't exist, then you really want to sidestep having to create it. Because it's a lot of work to manufacture a language that doesn't turn out to be an elaborate cipher for your own native language. Uh, it's, and it's, it's a difficult proposition, and it's time-consuming. So, for the most part, you want to avoid doing that. It also allows the author to tell stories set in different times and different countries without having to speak the language. They may, they may understand the culture, they may understand the history, but they may not speak the language. In fact, they probably don't. And that, while their understanding might not be perfect, by pulling the language out of the equation, you can actually eliminate a lot of actual errors. It also lightens the burden for the audience because they don't have to understand multiple languages or deal with translations in one form or another, like subtitles. That adds a cognitive burden for, um, for reading some, uh, uh, or watching a, uh, a story if you have to deal with translating multiple languages or something like that. Even if it's just original language text followed by a translation, that's still extra cognitive load. And it also removes a certain amount of distraction from the story itself. And this point here, in fact, is the uh, biggest defense you can have for the puns and cultural references um, uh, being only uh, applicable to the audience's uh, uh, culture or language. Uh, this, uh, if, if uh, doing it right really, really distracts from the story, um, then applying a cultural translation layer on top can make some sense. Just make sure that if you're doing this, you know that you're doing it and you're not just doing it accidentally and letting these things slip in. And it would be useful if this is the case, and it's not some sort of a well-known story, that it, 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 the fact that you did it be obvious in some manner. Okay, so uh, closing comments. Um, well, uh, translation, uh, translator convention is generally helpful. And it, it's uh, such a common thing that people don't even necessarily notice it's happening. Uh, oftentimes, that's your, um, your English-speaking aliens trope in science fiction, or uh, that fantasy world that isn't Earth somehow uh, having a whole bunch of, uh, of wizards speaking with a British accent, or, or something like that. The, so the translator convention is not inherently bad. In fact, it's generally a good thing. Uh, I, I certainly uh, wouldn't want to have to deal with uh, uh, with a lot of stories if I had to learn another language just to read them. Uh, it's uh, it is easy to let things creep in there that shouldn't, and that 
that's part of the due diligence of writing and something that if you're getting published and you have an editor your editor should be looking for as well though for the most part they don't catch these things because they are usually part of the target audience so they're going to catch those cultural references now i did say i was going to talk about uh, a secondary translation uh, on top of the translator convention during the closing comments uh, and that uh, that actually adds an interesting level of complication when the language that say you wrote your work in in uh, Japanese and you had a whole bunch of characters that were American and they were speaking American English now somebody comes along and they decide to translate your Japanese work with English speaking characters using the translator convention into English. Well, now you have an interesting conundrum because you've now, with translated works, you've got a, a sort of um, weaker version of the translator convention going on. Uh, for characters that, you know, you generally assume that the characters are speaking whatever the original language of the work is, uh, unless uh, there's some indicator that they're speaking some other language. And oftentimes that's going, that's going to actually uh, be uh, in uh, uh, television or movie, that's going to be subtitled uh, with the actual language being spoken, uh, which makes translating kind of fun. Uh, and sometimes, uh, like in written, uh, now you've got the translator convention going on, uh, which translated the uh, English into Japanese, and now you have to somehow get the Japanese into English, and as a result, you're going to end up with English-speaking people speaking an English that's uh, actually gone via Japanese back to English and that's going to cause some confusion for the English uh, uh, readers uh, because especially if you've uh, done cultural references and things like that like say Red String of Fate or uh, uh, Sneezing uh, Superstitions or something like that uh, because while the uh, English speaking audience and the American audience uh, should understand what these American people would be uh, saying and when their their references and so on, that information, the the ability to make a perfect translation of what was being said is impossible. Because while it was a perfect translation into Japanese, uh, per the translator convention, it cannot now be a perfect translation back to English. Because actual translation can never be perfect. There's always something that doesn't translate properly. Um, and that's something, this actually does cause some pain for uh, translators that are translating um, works that uh, use this trope. Uh, so it does require some careful work on the part of the translators. Uh, and, well, a lot of the time you can get back to something that works. Uh, you could easily uh, miss the intent or something like that. And uh, you could end up with cultural uh, behavior that doesn't make sense, especially if, the, if there's been cultural translation as well. Uh, this is easier to work around when you've got a, uh, a visual or audio visual medium where which had the the English being spoken with a Japanese translation on screen, uh, because then theoretically that English being spoken will be correct English. It usually isn't, but theoretically it would be. Uh, and you can just let the English audio stand and the uh, or or dub it with somebody with a proper accent, uh, and but otherwise let the uh, dialogue stand. And then, so that the uh, people watching in English can get the full effect, translate the Japanese translation as an additional subtitle. Uh, that can work, uh, and I've seen it done that way. Um, 
But this is one of the big drawbacks of the translator convention when real languages are in use. So, uh, uh, so it's something to be aware of if you're watching something that has been translated. Uh, you need to be aware of whether the translator convention was in effect or not. Because uh, that will allow you to identify uh, things that seem a bit awkward. Maybe they're a bit awkward because uh, you're getting a, a translation of a translator convention of something that should have been in your language in the first place. Now, this is less of an issue when you're dealing with uh, fictitious, uh, fictional languages, uh, simply because, obviously, nobody speaks that fictional language. So uh, you just translate it as best you can into the new language and uh, the translated version and go on about, about your business. Although it still does require a certain understanding of the work in question so that you don't introduce extra inconsistencies during the translation of the translator convention stuff. Uh, that's actually something to be aware of anything that's translated. The translation is not necessarily going to be perfect, so you'll definitely want to pay attention. And uh, if something doesn't quite make sense, it's probably because the translation didn't quite work. Anyway, uh, the leaving aside multiple levels of translation, which is always a problem for intelligibility. The translator convention is not a bad thing. And even when it's screwed up, uh, for the most part, it doesn't really break the story itself from the perspective of the original intended audience. Uh, it's only when you end up with... Uh, somebody thinking about it after the fact or something like that, that it tends to cause uh, any kind of dissonance. So, in general, uh, it would be nice if writers would consider uh, what they're doing when they're uh, writing something that is supposed to be in a foreign language and consider that, make sure that they're not uh, uh, superimposing uh, their language rules and of humor and so on on top of the uh, the uh, the the foreign language uh, you know it, just so that uh, there's less confusion for the people that actually think it through and and you'll find that your stories tend to get a little bit better if you pay attention to this sort of detail so you'll probably catch other errors that you're making uh, while you're looking for this type of detail. Anyway, that's probably enough on the translator convention and screwing it up and that sort of thing. Uh, so I'm going to leave this one here. Uh, I'll probably have another video in the next uh, week or three on uh, good old ye olde English. Um, and yes, I butchered that intentionally. Uh, but for now, uh, if you want to be notified of future videos, make sure to subscribe. And if you've watched this far, thanks for watching.